Okay, James, welcome to Basis 23, part three. Different day, different time. Uh, we were talking in the last two parts about the mixture of bloodlines and uh, that clone that's going around called uh, Roosevelt, Rock Rockefeller. Uh, what does the meaning of bloodlines, what's the significance of that? What, 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 a, what, what are the individual bloodlines and what is the significance of bringing them together? Well, as I mentioned on the last um, section, there's two main bloodlines that come together which is one is a Zionist Jewish bloodline, some say the descendants of Jesus, and then the other is um, the, the Odinist bloodline, it's a Germanic Aryan bloodline. So the two have uh, they've been at war with each other for a long time, and now it's joining together of the two. And the leaders of both bloodlines, they you mentioned what's the relevance for the average Joe. They don't care about the average person. They're getting ready to move into a transhuman world where uh, everybody, most people are either dead or they're converted. Now, what do you mean by dead or converted? They've either been reduced, the population has been reduced and they're part of that or the ones that survive have been converted into um, a so-called transhuman. What? Now, now okay, let, let's go back. What was the origin of this war uh, and where, what does that war derive from? Um, the war between the two bloodlines has um, it's gone back probably thousands of years to um, Atlantis, but in modern history it's um, seen its expression in the Russian Revolution in the early 1900s, where the Bolshevik, uh, the, the Bolshevik Jews, um, they slaughtered millions of white Russians during the, the Red Terror. And the white Russians were Caucasian or, or Slavic? Or, or... Uh, they were Caucasian. Yeah. And it was the Bolshevik Jews who were in charge of the, the Red Terror, the Russian Revolution. So that it had its expression in that, and then World War II, um, the the Aryans returned the favor in kind, and took out a lot of Jews. So it's been going back and forth in that in its modern expression. Okay, that's a modern expression, but uh, did, was this an extraterrestrial war that's come that's come terrestrial? Um, yes, they're definitely the two non-human races. Uh, one side, the, the Jewish side, the the leaders are a uh, reptilian race who they're actually reptilians, but they they look, they pose as human shapeshifters. So I mean, are you saying the Zionists or the Zionists different to the to the Jews? A... Um, the 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 elite, the leaders who are running that bloodline, are reptilian. Um, reptilians who, like I say, cloak themselves in human form. The, the Odinists, the Germanic bloodline is, um, there's definitely a lot of reptilian DNA, but they're not reptilian shapeshifters, they're cyborgs, they're more human looking cyborgs. So essentially we're dealing with a reptilian war, a reptilian faction? Yeah, it's, we're dealing with a reptilian war, two, two reptilian factions, uh, They've been fighting against each other, that's true, yes. And they, <laughs> they control the earth or have, seek to control the earth. What are the other root races on the earth? I mean, you've got the Chinese, Indians, all those other you know, types. Um, they, what well, what they, say do they have on this? Well, that's I mean, if we're talking about a global population reduction, surely they'd like to know um, what was the reason. They are considered by the ruling races to be subhuman races who um, interbred with animals. So, for instance, the, um, the black race was um, supposedly originally a white race and uh, an off-planet white race who was uh, the ancestors of the black race were apparently trapped on some planet, uh, some unpleasantly hot jungle planet, and they caught, uh, the males caught some um, type of disease, some type of rabies, um, jungle 
sort of fever disease and most of the males died. The females subsequently went insane and um, started to mate with the uh, jungle monkeys and gorillas. And from that, the, uh, the black race was created. So no, was this is obviously very controversial stuff. There'll be three people throwing, you know, God knows what at, 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 at the screen. I mean, where does this information come from? Well, that information was given to, um, th this is the information that is taught at the uh, higher levels of these secret societies, but this particular information was given to uh, Billy Meyer from Semyazi, the uh, female Pleiadian that they visited. And um, so the information, the origins of the black race were confirmed by her. Now she was... Um, it seems that Semyazi, the Billy Meyer contact, was actually Maria Ortish. And what's the significance of that? Well, the, um, the, the Pleiadians that visited Billy Meyer in Switzerland, they, they came down in their ships, but they seemed to be giving him um, what appeared to me to be Jewish communist propaganda. And... Um, but the sa uh, at the same time, they were they were giving him um, access to laser beam weapons that could uh, fire f uh, through trees and leave huge holes in trees. This so they were talk talking about about Billy Meyer. What's that, Miles? You're, you're talking Billy Meyer here. Uh, yes, that's true. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, some people would say that whole story is a complete hoax. I mean, he, he hoaxed the whole thing, made models and stuff. I mean, how do you, how do you get around that problem? Um, I mean, I'm not here to talk about Billy Meyer, yeah, okay. but I, I believe it's a real, a true case. Okay, so we're getting down to the original root races, but you're really basing a lot of the history on what, really what happened in the 20th century. Uh, and, but you connected Atlantis there. Uh, the, uh, the Irish, or the, the, those who civilized uh, Europe from the West, i.e. what we now call the, the, the British Isles. Well, I mean, what, you came from Cornwall, or that was where you, that's where you grew up. Uh, what's the connection with, with Atlantis there? Um, I think there was a big Phoenician connection with uh, Cornwall, and even the, the descendants of Odin uh, were, they came to the British Isles and Cornwall, because the, the progenitor of the Germanic race um, the Aryan race was actually Odin himself. Now, um, if you mention this, obviously you know, you, people don't want to have to get a degree in ancient history to understand this, but yeah. um, the, line, the Odin line can be traced um, through the uh, Eric Bloodaxe, the, the king of Norway, uh, also known as Eric the Red. Now. Right. He came to uh, Northumbria, Northern England, in 90, uh, 947 AD, and he was the king of England in Northumbria at the time. And so after that, a lot of the English kings descended from him. He was Eric Bloodaxe, the king of Norway, a uh, descendant of Odin himself. Now, but you're talking basically a reptilian faction as, as human. Yeah. So, the, uh, I mean, I mean, this is a bit rich. If you've got an alien reptilian shape-shifting race, then accusing the other ones of not of being subhuman. I mean, how, how does all that work out? You got Chinese, the, the Sino races, and the the Indian races. Then, um, they I mean, if they're all going to be wiped out in some global new world order thing, surely they'd like to sort of vaguely know really what's the cause. They're just it's the survival of the fittest. Um, in nature, um, you ne you'll never see a superior race give um, charity to a weaker race. What I mean by that is, um, in nature, if there's a weaker species of bird or a weaker species of um, wolf, for instance, the stronger species won't turn around and help the weaker species to survive. The uh, nature will find a way to get rid of the weaker species as quickly as possible. So the uh, strongest survival of the fittest will stay at the top of the chain. And that, that these are un unchanging laws of nature. So we, what, we're looking f what we're looking at 
is an agenda which will reduce the population. Is this the uh, the Georgia Whitestones agenda, basically? Uh, yes, it's connected to that. Yes. And uh, this is what the, the function of the Fourth Reich is? Uh, yes. I mean, they haven't changed their policies. It's um, like we... Uh, like we discussed in the last section, that they're, they're looking to recreate a, a paradise earth again, almost like going back to the Garden of Eden, which is almost like a um, the earth transformed into one big, like na uh, similar to a national fo uh, national park. But where does all the machinery come from to run this? Uh, where does all this, uh, you know, where how is this paradise run? Um, I think you can terraform a planet very quickly with the right machinery. I mean, there's a lot of machinery stored all over the place. And that effectively would mean uh, changing the atmosphere pretty rapidly. Uh, yeah, it'd be a very um, oxygen-rich atmosphere with a lot of trees. Uh, but how do you? What's the plan to basically reduce the population to start with? Um, I think the what's going to happen now is there's a lot of de demanding of the British and American armies. Yes, uh, I mean I noticed uh, there's a huge demanding. I mean, uh, and and the infrastructure of the of the British armed services are being is collapsing, basically. Um, so, the, what what you're going to see is the wars in the Middle East winding down now, the whole Middle East conflict winding down. They're going to get rid of a lot of the soldiers. They're going to break this standard British and American army down. And um, there's going to be the focus that now is going to be on America. Once the wars in the Middle East start to wind down, the world's eyes are going to be on America. And that's all going to be about racial issues. Every, race is going to be brought into every subject now. And, um, and of course, with Obama as president, which it seems that quite a few people knew he was going to be president uh, before the election, uh, how, how does that play out? Well, Obama is now um, making statements like, we need to focus on race, let's talk about race. And that is going to be um, the focus, the world media is going to be focused on America now. Well, and, what uh, about, the, I mean, the geopolitical, the political situation contains a number of nuclear powers, like Korea, uh, China, you know, would they not have something to say about this? Would India not have something to say about this? Um, yes, I mean, there's some, that something big is gearing up. The, Obama's a Marxist communist, though, essentially. So he will push in the agendas of um, the Zionists, which will be race mixing, race issues in America. But that doesn't get, that doesn't basically solve the problem that, you know, America has got to deal with, if there's going to be, if you're going to bump a lot of people off, Maybe they may wish to sort of maybe not be bumped off. I mean, how, what's, how is the agenda going to deal with, with these uh, people who are going to maybe slightly object to this? Well, America is, is finished. America is gone. That is what the main thing standing in the way of the, uh, the new world. I mean, you've gone so, to America, you've joined the American army, but you initially opened this, this basis by saying you're with the Fourth Reich. Well, the, the new IBIS um, protocols uh, stated they needed to uh, seed foreign agents into foreign militaries. So we're just bringing this agenda in one step at a time. But the, the, the basic thing is... I mean, if, if uh, as civilizations constantly migrate, follow the sun. You know, the the, the Austro-Hungarian Empire collapsed, uh, formed you know formed the British Empire, then British Empire collapsed. You got the American Empire, and the American Empire is going to collapse, and you got the Chinese Empire. Surely that's the logic of it. But surely the Chinese are the next big players in this game. How are they going to be stopped? How, what's the plan to deal with them? Well, I don't think the plan is to stop them. I think the plan is to stir up World War Three to help with the population reduction, because the same people are running all the governments and all the countries. The uh, the individual who uh, and the group, small group of individuals who were given the artifacts, the Spear of Destiny, or Odin's Spear, Gungnir, they would have the um, ability to shape the course of whole nations. And um, 
it's an important point to say um, this event happened to myself and Gridkeeper um, starting in 2007. There was another individual with us at the time we, we were close with. Now, we were caught, the three of us were contacted by an individual from America, from um, North Carolina. And this guy was um, high-level Illuminati, was actually um, close to JFK, John Kennedy, when he was a child. Yeah. Now, um, he, what had happened was when he was a child, um, he used to play in the, lo in the woods in North Carolina near his home. And two individuals approached him in the woods. Um, they, they matched the description of Sam Yazi and uh, one of the male played in contactees of Billy Meyer. Uh, they matched the exact description. They were dressed in white robes. And um, Sam Yazi being Maria Ortish. Now they approached um, our friend, his name's Michael too. And um, they presented him with an artifact in the woods and said, this belongs to you. And it was a spear. Um, it was a gold spear. And um, he said, "Why?" he was questioning, why does it belong, it belong to me? And they said, when you're older, you'll understand. And they tried to give it back to the male. And the male didn't want it. He, he, was, he seemed scared to touch it. And he said, no, I can't look after this anymore. We have to give this to you. And you In have other to words, once you t take it, you sort of imprint on it? You sort of take ownership? It can only be given to certain bloodlines. And um, this guy was a descendant of Charlemagne, the French king. And um, he, he was instructed to take it and bury it, hide it, which he did. And it stayed buried for a number of years. And um, when he... He came to this individual, came to visit us in England, got the plane over. Now he said um, he just changed the locations. He, he buried it in a new location and had showed us photographs in a new location where it was buried. And um, he, he, we arrived, he arrived in, in Chichester and the four of us, we drove up to Scotland together, up to Balmoral in Scotland. And um, we were supposed to be involved there in a ritual. Um, we, were, we were based near Balmoral Castle. And um, the, the Queen, we knew the Queen was there at the time. I think Prince Charles was there at the time visiting. And um, we, we, we posted ourselves up one night near Balmoral Castle on a hill. And we, we did our own ritual, our own uh, basis on, based on Knights Templar rituals. You just excuse me a second, Mark. Is that the pussy cat? Yeah, it's letting the cat out. Um, so we based our ritual on Knights Templar uh, rituals. And, um, Are you able to mention anything, the significance of those rituals? Anything at all? It goes back to France. Um, in the 18th century, which is important in all this, especially the area of Alsace-Lorraine on the, the border of France and Germany. So we, um, we called these rituals the Knights of Sabathiel rituals. And um, when we completed the rituals, um, kind of black triangle crafts appeared and started to uh, fly near us. And um, so we, we ended up with some missing time and it Are you, recovered. Uh, okay. What part of, where were you based? At, in, we were at just the, near Balmoral Castle. Just, uh, just in it? No, just near, just on the outskirts of Balmoral Castle, just on the hills, just outside the castle. But what, you weren't in the, the grounds of the Balmoral? Right on the, in the grounds. No, we were just outside the grounds. Yeah. And then the t we completed our ritual one night and TR3s turned up. We had some missing time, and it turns out we've been taken to the castle where we've been involved in the second part of the ritual where the queen was there, and um, we were supposed to be measured on this special type of technology, um, like, scale, like a type of scale 
where the person who remembered the most from France 18th century would appear to be lightest, would physically be lightest on the scale. And uh, the person who was lightest would be empowered with the Spear of Odin. So out of the four of us, um, one of us was empowered with the Spear. Was that the Grid Keeper? Uh, I don't want to say who it, who it was. Okay. Um, but we all worked together, the four of us. And um, so the, the spear is brought out from time to time. And it seems to, when you touch it, you, be, you, you seem to change on a genetic level where you remember what you could do as an Atlantean Superman. And then you can recreate what you could do back then. The Atlantean supermen, were they the modified versions of humanity at that time, which is what got the Atlanteans into trouble? Is that why they were wiped out? Um, I think... I mean, I think they were the original Fourth, fourth Reich, and the, the leaders obviously survived uh, since that time. So they're alive in modern times, so they're thousands of years old. But the spear, the Odin spear Gungan is, and it is essentially a, an ancient Atlantean artifact. If so it's a terrestrial artifact from the, uh, from that era. Uh, yes, that's correct. And um, when it links up with the soldier, um, the soldier can have the the ability to um, levitate and other abilities, generate force fields around their bodies. Yeah. And um, even the, 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 the plasma weaponry that comes out of the eyes. And now, yesterday out, you said it came out of the knuckle. Yeah, it, it comes out of the, uh, the knuckle, the middle knuckle, just here. Yeah. And uh, comes out the eyes too. And... Um, this this technology it can it can cut people in half or it can just set their head on fire set the whole being on fire it can disintegrate the whole person and it can be opened up where it can um you mean defocus be, to a wider beam yeah with a wider beam exactly so you can be positioned in a higher position and you could open up the beam and essentially you could um take out a whole army with it. So you could have one person basically take out a whole army? Yeah, exactly. And so is that, that's basically what the super soul you're manufacturing is, is about? With the, you mentioned the addition of the these reptilian arms and things. The, this is done with hardware. Um, I mean, the, the beings, uh, I think a lot of these four Reich soldiers are originally obviously from Atlantis, but Aldebaran before this. And um, what is our, what is that? What's Aldebaran? Al 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 is it another? Well, it's is it the, the inner earth or, or? The star system in the Pleiades. And I think there's connections to the inner earth who uh, the Viril Society were in contact with the Aldebarans and... Uh, the, the, I mean, the German language is a form of Aldebaran. It, it's uh, the Anunnaki language, basically. And Michael Prince is actually a Aldebaran name. It's, it's a, not a it's rank a, then. It's a German name, but the closest English translation is Michael Prince. Now, is that your adopted name, or for what? What's your? What's your? your that name? is the name that my mother gave me at birth, okay. and uh, my mother is from Aldebaran. Now, is she there in the sense that she's reincarnated, or is she physic her body physically? Physically, she's very old. Um, 
I mean, there's a lot of uh, controversy about who my biological father is. I know um, in Canada, in the base in the 70s, um, Alfred Bonner would take me out the facility and he had a cabin in the mountains. And as a baby and as a young child, he'd carry me through the snow um, in his arms, up through the mountains, up to the cabin, up to his cabin. And uh, he had a fireplace there and he'd read me stories and things like that. That was the only time I had human contact at the base. Uh, it was the only time I was shown any uh, affection. And what kind of things were you shown? Well, he would take me from the base and he wrapped me up in a blanket and he'd just carry me in the snow up the mountain and he'd carry me to his cabin. And there we would just um, sit in front of the fireplace and he'd read me stories. We'd stay up there for a couple of days at a time. Just ordinary fairy tales or what? Uh, there was a lot of Norse mythology that he'd read me. Um, so that was the closest thing I it was a father-son relationship at the time, any sort of human contact. Because it was a different story in the in the facility itself. I don't know why they were letting people take the babies out for a couple of days at a time, but they were. Well, there must have been a reason for that to to give them some kind of empathic contact with a with a human or what, or or did well, Bonner shape shift or what? Bonner's not human, but I mean he looks human. But that is that's a human kind of um, relationship or a show, shows of affection. So maybe so we could. Uh, function in society and pass ourselves off as human when we were older. At what age was you uh, at this time of when this was initiated? He uh, would do that when I was a baby. Yeah, so it he, has to be done he, at that young age. He just I just remember him, he'd wrap me up in a blanket when I was just a little baby and carry me through the snow. And then it went up to about the age of three or four. But at the age of four, that's when the rescue happened, so we were moved out of Canada anyway. So then your, your, your childhood, it was, how did you get to Cornwall then? I um, was taken by my adopted mother to um, England in around 1980, and then we traveled all around the world, like Malaysia and different places. Yeah. And we set back in England uh, around London, then moved to Berkshire. And the Peasmore place. So while my stepfather worked near Peasmore, it was fairly close to Peasmore. My school was near Peasmore, uh, Deanfield Secondary School. With that, I gather uh, the present Prime Minister came from Peasmore, spent some time there. I heard David Cameron grew up or something in Peasmore of some connection. Yeah. But I mean, that's probably just a coincidence. There wouldn't be any. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm sure there's no thing, no such thing. <laughs> so wh where do you sit? Where do you? You've now uh, okay. You, that brings us up to really a, some of a lot of the material that we covered in, in bases nine, I think. Um, I mean, since then, I've ha I've had more of an understanding of. Um, what I am and what I'm capable of, um, just from memories from the operations with the US Army. I mean, we were definitely given a lot of scopolamine during these operations. Where, what's that? What kind of drug is that? I bring, well, they, we're bringing basically to the, to the last 12 months. The scopolamine is, uh, they call it the devil's breath. It's found down in South America. It's from a plant. And the CIA have weaponized it. And... Um, you can, you're still awake and you can still conscious and you can still move around, but you're in a very open, suggestible state. Um, there's been video footage of people using it in South America and they've blown the powder into people's faces and then they've got the person to take them to the ATM machine and empty their um, bank account out themselves and give the person all their money. Right. So this is, it makes you very suggestible and then it's destroyed. It, doesn't destroy the memories, but suppresses the memories. You don't remember a thing afterwards. It's like a super, a super roofy kind of thing. So does that mean that you will eventually remember your exploits 
that you've gone through the well, last they're starting nine months. to come back um they're definitely a lot of this stuff connecting with the spear and they, they're using these plasma cannons and using these plasma laser beams um there's a lot of that a lot of that going on um now there was a video video uploaded to YouTube in July 2011, and it was uploaded by John Hutchison, the government scientist. Yes. Well, I don't uh, know if he was a government scientist, but the, you're talking he, to the guy who they got you, the Hutchison effect. Hutchison. Well, apparently he did work for the government. He did um, some. He worked for some intelligence agency, and he was actually based in Canada and British Columbia. Uh, interestingly enough, I think that's where he was from, and. Um, now he uploaded this video of um, a, a police officer in America, and he uploaded this video in, I think it was uh, July 2011. Um, a police officer stops a guy on the side of the road in a car, gets out to question the guy, and the guy hits him with some kind of laser death ray and disintegrates the police officer next to the car and leaves him in like a, a, a smoldering pile of bones on the floor and then drives off. Now, I sent you a link to that video. Um, now, the, the picture of me with the stone was taken in October 2011. And um, now, John Hutchison worked, his speciality was working with advanced laser beams. We call it the death ray. Yeah. A now, laser, of course, being a, 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 lot more, a, mo a lot more than just a beam of light. It's, it's, a, it's a lot more you can do in that. Well, this is what they've miniaturized these, and in, they, like, they've incorporated it into the cybernetic exoskeleton. Tiny little plasma cannons, but they're devastatingly powerful. And um, that means they're able to deliver some, uh, m m more than just a shattering blow. It must, it must actually transfer that energy very effectively to, to the rest of the substance, so it just obliterates it. Well, I mean. Um, it can, yeah. I mean, it would. It can just. It can do so much. It can leave a person in a small pile of smoldering bones on the floor, and just completely microwave them. And um, this. Now, when I was handed the the Brazilian princess topaz in the, the J.P. Morgan Hall of Gems, now I was supposed to hold in, tune in to a particular reptilian who was on the run. This reptilian. Now right. his name was Belial. 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 Now. Um, B i l y. B b e l uh, i e l Belial. Now um, I first remember meeting Belial in um, a place called Cloud's House in Wiltshire around 2003. Now this house was owned by As Alistair Crowley. And um, I'm Is not going to say what where Bikes in Wiltshire. Um, I mean, it's, it's crop a, circle country, Boscombe Down, Porton Down. Yeah, it's near Boscombe Down. It's in a place called East Noyle, East Noyle, Wiltshire. Right. It's not now. Um, yeah, it's called Clow's House. It's quite a famous place. Owned, it used to be owned by Alistair Crowley. There's the statues of devils and reptilians all over the walls there. I'm not going to say what I was doing there, but there's entrances to the underground base, bases in the area, in that house. And well, there's Boscombe, Porton, and uh, I think another base there. Yeah, yeah. And um, they have ships approaching, and people and beings uh, come from, that, from the ship straight into the house. And then from the house, it's a big mansion, they, they come into uh, human society. So that, it's a big um, gateway, that, that house, it's a very important place. Yeah, I mean, we have, a, we have a, a, an eyewitness to somebody seeing a large UFO come down and land at Porton Down. So maybe... it's, very it's very close by. I mean, it's a, it's a, huge, a huge gateway for, for activity, alien activity into England. And um, so I was actually staying there, sleeping at the house there. I spent about six weeks there. And uh, one night, two NSA agents came into my room and took me down to one of the larger rooms downstairs, 
And there was an old chair set out, and there was a being with his back to me sat down. He looked like an old man with a, a robe on and a hood up. And when I walked to the front, he looked up and it was a uh, reptilian with uh, reptilian eyes, horns. Uh, How many horns? What did it look like? Just two. Just one here and one here. Red skin, reptilian eyes. Looked like your classic um, portrayal of the devil, really. I mean, a bit like the guy in uh, the Star Wars film? Yeah, Darth Maul, similar to that, yeah. And um, he, we, I sat down, and um, I mean, when he looked up, and I saw it was a reptilian, I kind of staggered back, but then I got my wits about me, and we sat down, and we had a conversation. I'm not sure if it was telepathic or not, and um, he was talking about how do we, the two bloodlines, create, come together to create this symbol the uh, swastika within the Star of David. You want to know how how the two bloodlines have come together? Yeah, I looked that up. It um, it's like I say, it's a sign of the Raelians, but I'm not sure um, which which uh, which direction the swastika goes in. But I know the swastika fits perfectly in the Star of David, and uh, the swastika, the Nazi swastika, is a symbol of Thor's hammer, which is another Odinist artifact. So. He, Belial, wanted to know how we could, the two bloodlines had come together. And um, we talked about this. And for, I don't know the full story, but Belial ended up on the run in America somehow in 2011. And I was handed the stone with his essence to track him down. You were and handed what? I was handed the stone out the case in J.P. Morgan's Hall of Right, Jam. that, yes, okay. Uh, Princess Diana's cousin was there. And uh, he, introdu he introduced me to these people. My wife's family originally introduced me to these people. But he got me deeper in, Princess Diana's cousin. I won't say his name. And um, I held the stone, tuned into his essence, and then... The mission, the mission was Operation Belial, to track Belial down across different states. And somehow, um, the, the video where the policeman has disintegrated one of these plasma beams uh, is connected to the, the, the Belial manhunt. And that was somehow connected to the state of Arizona at the time. And did they get him? But, did, did you get him? We got him in the end, but what is interesting is that... Um, what, what, what happened? Well, the video was uploaded in July of 2011. Um, now, the, the picture of me holding the Brazilian princess is taken after that, in October um, of 2011. So... There seemed to be some kind of time travel element going on where we were we were going back in time a few months, in, still into America, but to search for Delisle, because it's really it's really difficult to get information on the video. It's um, all I've been able to find out is that it was supposedly a Rothschild was driving the car. The the car where the individual inside disintegrated the policeman. It was a Rothschild, and we've found out that the license plate was from the 1950s of the car. And what uh, type of car was it? I'm not exactly sure. It looked it's like it could possibly be a Ford or something like that. In other words, was it a um, modern car? I mean, a 1950s a car. car. Bit of a... Yes, it's definitely a modern car, but apparently the license plate was from the 1950s. And then it belonged to a guy who went missing in 1953, but on a modern car. So there's a bit of a dilemma there. Why use a why use a a, a well out of date license plate? Surely that is that why the police picked them up in the first place, or? It possibly. I mean, I don't. It doesn't make sense. Why would you use a number plate like that on a modern car to make yourself be? Uh, draw attention from the police and then get pulled over and then have to murder a policeman because you can't be stopped, the mission is too important. So uh, it's a bit uh, 
bit like maybe when you're drawing attention to yourself like that there must be a reason maybe it was to send a message or something um I mean, they use a, they always change number plates around. It, we, in St. Ives, that a van pulled up on um, the terrace I lived in. I thought I recognised some of the people there. They moved into the holiday rent next door, so I had the number plate checked out by some intelligence contact, and the number plate was registered to three separate vehicles. So, um, it, so it's basically impossible to track it. Right. But obviously, we're talking about the whole Belial thing. And, um, so what happened to this guy? What happened to what guy? Which guy? Well, you fi he was found and then... Um, he was found and then... What was the function was, of the manhunt? What's the fun what happened to this guy? What's, what's, the, what's the culmination of the story? I don't honestly have the answer to that. There's still blurs. I can't remember. Right. I just remember so what what details. was the function what, what, of the, the function? ceremony with the Queen in Balmoral? You brought that story in. Uh, for, for what happened there ultimately? Because they wanted to um, find out the four of us who, who the, the spear can only go to one man. Yeah. What one man runs the Illuminati? The, as we discussed before, the eye at the top of the pyramid represents yeah. one man. Now, so what, the spear can only go. To one man. What about this guy that we d discussed? This uh, this this Rockefeller guy. Who who the, who looks like you? The clone. Um, well, according to the online book written by Wes Penray, he was part of a program to look for certain children in the nineteen seventies. He was born. He was the same age as me. Yeah. Uh, and you told me today that he's the adopted son of David. Well, apparently so. I mean, know. I mean, uh, that's somebody else's research. So, well, I didn't know that, but that's interesting because all the children in the Ibis program are adopted into other families. We have we have got a couple of researchers in the Amash project who who are independently just furrowing away and finding out stuff. Well, uh, the Illuminati is saying he's the physical embodiment of Lucifer or Satan on the earth. And that was the ultimate point of Project Mannequin. One of the 42 was going to be the uh, embodiment of Satan or Lucifer in human form. Because like many religions, the Illuminati religion has a messiah. And what, is, is Lucifer the messiah for them? Well, it's a Luciferian religion. They believe that Jesus, Lucifer, and Thor are the same person. That the Germanic, the Nazis were waiting for a messiah too, a Germanic messiah. And this is, symbol... are they saying now that this has happened? That they have their well, messiah? One of, one of the 42 is the messiah. It will, well, these are religious terms, which I don't like to get into. But they believe one of the 42 is going to be a major leader. Well, it's interesting that that number comes up in the comedy uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, uh, which um, the secret, the, the answer to the secret of the universe, life, and everything else is 42, which is a bit of a joke. But if it's meant to be Lucifer, it doesn't make that program that funny. Oh, uh, well, that's interesting, because I never knew the uh, relevance to the number 42. Well, in the comedy, which is on the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, that was the, you know, the great answer to life, the universe, and everything. Uh, so, what is the time scale of, of what's expected for the rest of humanity? Are we talking global destruction, wars, doom, gloom, or whatever? I don't have a time scale. I don't think that it's going to happen in the next couple of years. I think people have got a fair amount of time left. I think a lot of important things can happen between now and 2030. So we've got a plenty of time. We've got plenty of time. But it's kids. it's kind of set in stone. It can't be changed, and it's just the natural order of things. The kind of things you've just been saying are pretty emotive, and surely there's going to be a few people that are going to object to this. And you're obviously saying it on video. So what's actually the cause? What's the point of doing this? What's who gains? Who benefits?
I think there's some, some people that are important to us that we want to see survive. And this will help them to come forward, maybe remember a few, some more details and come forward. It's where we haven't, um, the shepherds haven't fully gathered their flocks yet. Now, there's two, pe there's two independent forms of new humanities coming along. Uh, I mean, we interviewed Mary Rodwell quite recently, and there's all these new children coming forward. Their DNA is, is being in indicates that they're uh, a much... Uh, much superior, they've got a great deal more to offer, but the education system that we have is being used to program any of that out of them before they grow up. And then secondly, uh, we understand from some sources that the whole point of the Falklands War was a black goo that the Argentinians were working with, with some kind of alien race in the uh, Thule Island, south of the Falkland Islands, and that black goo was used by the British in some kind of super soldier program which failed. Mm. And they then, you know, did the good old British thing, just flushed it down the toilet. And that is creating a series of upgraded human beings. I mean, this claims to come from uh, an, a guy who's, uh, it, some of this information comes from researcher in the extrapolitics, David Griffin, and also another one uh, who claims to be the son of an MI6 agent, who is saying that uh, this is, going to change humanity in the next 10 years are going to be a whole lot of new enhanced beings what what's what's the what's the angle on that are, are we are these stories which are together are they congruent or independent i think um the first point where is the uh the education system for the for the new children is designed purposely to uh so they to not be able to be understood um for instance it's definitely a Zionist Jewish controlled education system and media. Um, whereas in the army, the textbooks were, say the medic textbooks for instance, um, it was like they were written by some kind of computer, not a person. And it was just so boring, the, the, inf the text was just laid out in such a mind-numbingly boring way that it was difficult to um, read it basically and for is there some kind of psychotronic programming within the text to actually basically just do your head in yeah exactly and it was uh, for a person who switched on with a, with a special type of DNA it's, it's designed they, they just can't take it in it's just mind numbingly boring and then they can, they can say oh well this person has ADD and we need to uh damage them with dangerous drugs. So, um, I mean, there is, a, there is a, a, a school of thought in the United States that everybody is technically insane. Anybody who rebels against the government is clearly insane and they need drugs to medicate them. So basically, I think the point is that if you're gifted in some ways, you're not going to be able to follow the education system and be uh, classed as stupid. So the only way around that is private education? Oh, I, I mean maybe homeschooling or something like that, but yeah. things have gone so far now, it's, it's going to take something huge to change all this now, it's just things have just gone to have fallen to such an extent. And then I think it leads onto the black goo subject. Um, there's, in the super soldier programs, there's something to do with um, these kind of worms. I don't fully understand it. Well, but, this is something which was happening to Marie Kayali's uh, daughter. Her, her head was full of these worms. They're putting worms in people. They're putting them in all different orifices in the body. And, I mean, uh, some of the implants that people have got are sort of like squiggly things with lots of legs. Yeah. I mean, it's all different. Some of them are really large. And um, I don't they're all doing. It's kind of nanotechnology. I'm not really a scientist, but I think... There's somehow one of the functions is they're eating the human organs and replacing them with cybernetic organs. It's one of the functions. Where they're eating the flesh and um, laying some kind of egg behind it, which is building cybernetic organs. So um, Is this the sort of like the nanotechnology will be used to sort of invade and, um, and take over? Yeah, and they're also... Uh, they eat, 
you can, can you can program the worm to do something and then put it in somebody and control that person with with these worms whatever they are now the the point of uh, is there any any way that anybody can reference any of this material uh, is is this available in any programs i mean there is something on the on the goo i mean there's uh, there's information from the, on the diamond spider wars on the internet but, um, where did this diamond spider war stuff come from? Uh, we have some evidence. We had some people say that they, there's, a, there's a colonies of these kinds of spiders. Whether mm -hmm. they're the diamond spiders that you're talking about in Cumbria, in mines in Cumbria. Yeah. Uh, um, um, yeah. What is a diamond spider? It's a huge spider. Uh, they grow up to, I think, 10 feet long. And they have a diamond exoskeleton. So they're very hard to kill. And they're from the moons, I think they're, they're on the moons of Saturn, they're on the moons of Pluto, Jupiter, I think. They have colonies there. So I think we're dealing with a lot of these insect races. Does that not mean that if they get warm, they'll fall apart? I mean, at our, at our body temperature? I think they can survive in normal uh, Earth climates. So basically, it's a crystalline, carbon-based life form. Yeah, I mean, they look like, they look like these life. tarantulas, but the exoskeleton is diamond, it's diamond based, similar to the super soldier exoskeletons, which is extremely hard metal. The closest thing could be a com closest earth element would be a combination of gold and diamond, which is cold fusion alloys from the, this moon of Saturn. Do you have any uh, names for, for, for that? For the moon? Yeah. Um, it's called, I think you pronounce it, Enphaladus. Is that the, is that the material or is it the moon? I, I, I'm not sure if that, there is a moon called that. That is the name of the moon, is Enphaladus. Okay, I, I'm not currently, I don't know where all the moons... Now, yeah, the, 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 the problem nice... about this is, uh, in the last few minutes of this part, uh, how were these moons discovered? How was this information mined? And how, how do these so-called spiders come here? I mean, are they physical in our domain? Yeah, physical, very physical. And they've, um, see a lot of these moons are guarded by these strange insect type creatures. So they, the, the moons are needed to be um, raided for the alloys. But then we're discovering these, in, in, all these insect type creatures and uh, now they're on Earth. In other words, they contaminated whatever came back from these moons. And I don't know exactly how they got here, but I know there's all pods coming down all over England. And they're full of different insects. Now, we have a whole thing in British schools, uh, or English schools particularly, called the Alien Pod Program. Have you heard of anything like that? Yeah, I've heard of it. Um, the Alien I mean, Pod seems to be a, 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 it's frightening the children because it's, it's set up. I mean, these are false things. They're actually made by the police. They bring them in and pretend. As, I mean, do you, what do you know about them? I think that the um, it's a kind of false flag operation because real pods are coming down, so they're setting up the false flag uh, pods in schools to kind of disguise what's happening as a cover. I know personally, my daughter um, has been there's I think a naval helicopter came to the school and some of the children were bundled onto the helicopter from the school, and uh, there's definitely like I say we've talked about this before pods have come down in uh, St. Ives, probably diamond spider pods. I mean, this is... Uh, is there any, any, any data anywhere where we can find out about this? Um, there's, there's data about the diamond spider wars on the internet released by a uh, naval intelligence guy, ex-naval intelligence guy. I think you just Google diamond spider wars. And it talks about some of the Diamond Spiders attacked some CIA bases in uh, Virginia, underground. Do they, do, they, do they prefer to be underground? Can they tolerate sunlight? How do we do they've, that? They, apparently they've appeared above ground, although in different countries, and attacked villages in India. And many people have died. But apparently they were the baby Diamond Spiders, not the fully grown ones. So what sort of size are they? Uh, like a huge tarantula. The babies, but the full-grown ones, I think, can grow to like about ten feet wide. So what? Uh, what? What sort of life cycle do they have? How long? I mean, I think they uh, they have like a, a king and queen, and I think the queen lives underground and lays the eggs inside rocks. 
This is what I heard. Uh, this is pretty fantastic stuff. Uh, before we have people running out of the cinemas screaming and terrified, uh, is there, is, uh, just to close up this part, uh, I mean, what, what are there any cases of this stuff? This is fantastic stuff. I mean, it's, it's completely fiction. I mean, it, nobody could possibly believe this is actually real. How does anybody believe this kind of thing? I mean, even getting the metal from the moons of uh, the secret space program or whatever is, this is all a concoction of fiction. Uh, why well, does one I, get I, any credibility I, on this? I mean, I'm not really here to gain credibility. People can take or leave it. We've done a good job to keep, protect people from this and keep it off the streets. But we're kind of getting to the point now where we're tired of doing it, spending all our time protecting people from it, and we're just going to kind of let it go and let, let it come onto the streets in some, in some ways. I mean, at Basis 9, you said uh, very briefly at the end of this... Uh, part um, you know there's a war going on and we're winning doesn't seem to be like that now um, an ET war I of some kind I'd say we're still in control of all the extraterrestrial situations on earth and uh, because the super soldiers are so advanced and so powerful that is the case how but many super soldiers let, let's talk about that in part two Four. Oh, four. And uh, tidy up any, any things you really want to get over or want, want to say. And uh, h how do we, in some way, verify this stuff? How do people get this on board and learn about it and find out about it? So uh, as we run out, of, uh, run out of tape, first hour, uh, I keep on wanting to call you James. Anyway, Michael, I'll be back. And you can maybe tell us about the t-shirt. Maybe there's something deep and significant about that, is there? Um, this is just a, a pagan symbol. A man standing between, sitting between two wolves. It's an old pagan Germanic symbol. All right. Okay, well, uh, part four awaits.